Hi everyone, welcome to Archiving Eden, a discussion. Um, this talk is put on behalf of the Museum of Contemporary Art Toronto, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Alexandra Brickman and I'm the Learning Coordinator here at MOCA Toronto. Um, so I just want to say thanks for tuning in on this uh, beautiful sunny Sunday. Um, this talk is put on um, as part of our TD Community Sunday program. Um, and so we're so pleased to have um, a few of our uh, guest speakers here today to join us. Um, so we do um, have Dornith Doherty, Saeed Dasky Beheshti, and Ivana Obradovic uh, joining us today, and I'll introduce them in just, uh, just a second. So just before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge that while many of you may be joining us from elsewhere, we are zooming in today on behalf of the Museum of Contemporary Art Toronto, which is situated on treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the ancestral homeland of the Haudenosaunee, Wendat, and Anishinaabe Nations. We gratefully acknowledge that MOCA is built upon these occupied territories and we respect our collective responsibility to recognize the legacies of colonial histories and the Indigenous voice within our museum's programming. So in our discussion today, we'll be chatting with Dornith Doherty, who is the artist behind Archiving Eden Exchange, um, which is an installation that was installed at MOCA um, starting in November 2019. Um, and it was meant to run through until May, um, but we do, as you know, we had to close our doors temporarily to the public um, in March due to the COVID-19 situation. Um, so I'll just uh, introduce our speakers before we get started. So we're pleased to have Dornith Doherty uh, joining us today. Um, Dornith is an artist whose work is concerned with the stewardship of the natural environment. Her photographic project, Archiving Eden, is an extensive body of work that documents the complex issues surrounding the role of science and human agency in preserving biodiversity. Collaborating with scientists and seedlings on five continents, she has traced in precise detail the elaborate systems of secure spaces and technological interventions required for botanical preservation. Doherty is a 2012 Guggenheim Foundation Fellow and her work has been exhibited widely in the US and internationally. She is currently a distinguished research professor at the University of North Texas. Welcome Dornith, we're so happy to have you. Thank you, Alexandra. I'm happy to be here. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, we're also pleased to be joined by Saye and Ivana. Um, they have both been involved with the Archiving Eden project since its first iteration at the Ontario Science Centre and then again when it was installed at MOCA Toronto. Um, Saye and Ivana have helped activate and facilitate visitor interactions with the work, um, both during seed workshops run by Saye and seed exchanges run by Ivana, which, both of which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, thank you, Saye and Ivana, for being here. Hi. Hello. Okay, so just a quick um, housekeeping uh, item before we get started. So if you do have questions for any of our speakers today, uh, please do type them in the Q&A box. Um, we'll be moderating that throughout the talk and then at the end, um, we'll go through any questions that haven't yet been addressed. Okay, so without further ado, um, I'd love to turn it over to Dornith. Um, so maybe Dornith, why don't you start us off by chatting about, um, you know, what is Archiving Eden and what was maybe the background and process for uh, creating this project? Oh, sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I think we have some slides. If, okay, so here is, uh, first off, I want to start by saying thank you to uh, Alexandra and also Sabrina and November Painter and the rest of the staff at MOCA Toronto for hosting this installation. It's really been a wonderful experience. Uh, I also wanted to mention uh, my friends at the Ontario Science Centre, uh, Anna Klajna, who had originally uh, curated this installation for the Ontario Science Center in conjunction with the Scotiabank uh, Contact Photography Festival. And I'm really, um, they fabricated the exterior part of the vault and uh, were really helpful in this, you know, the first and now this iteration. So uh, thank you to everybody at the Ontario Science Center that I uh, miss seeing you. So, um, uh, Archiving Eden, will you go to the next slide? Uh, Alexandra, do you mind? Here's a picture of me wearing literally every piece of heavy clothing I own in the whole world uh, at this Valbard Global Sea Vault. And I, this whole project, including the installation at the uh, MOCA Toronto, was inspired uh, by an article I read in 2008 about the opening of the Svalbard Vault. And I was so profoundly uh, moved by this notion of a global coordinated collaboration to try to present botanical diversity um, through collecting seeds from all over the world and placing them in the vault. So on one hand, it's a super pessimistic uh, scenario where you have 
global strife and political instability and ecological change uh, combining to pose an existential threat to our botanical life. But at the same time, you have a, a more optimistic scenario where scientists and volunteers and institutions from all over the world are collaborating together to create this first botanical kind of Noah's Ark. So when I heard about this, I immediately uh, wanted to photograph it. But it wasn't until years later that I was invited because it's only opened for a couple of days a year when they accession seeds. It's, you know, built on a mountaintop so tall that if both polar ice caps melt and the electricity goes out, the uh, seeds will remain safe for 200 years. So, um, so Alexandra, let's go to the next picture. So after, um, in the process of pursuing Archiving Eden, which is um, not only this installation, it's uh, photographic and, uh, it's a, a photographic and works on paper and video project. It became a, you know, a, more than a decade long wide ranging expeditionary project where I visited seed banks all over the world. But this one is uh, the interior of the Svalbard vault. And you can imagine that it's, you know, you walk into this vault and you're in the Arctic, but it's also like one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. And so it's, it looks really still because it's a photograph, but when you're there, it's, bitterly cold and uh, so cold that my digital equipment froze and I had to, uh, thank goodness I was using 19th century technology. I had a, you know, a view camera with film in it and I was able to take the photographs, but it is bitterly cold and super loud. It's filled with the air rushing that they use to preserve the seeds for 200 years or more. So, um, so as I worked in these different spaces again and again, they were each so different, but they posed these really powerful questions about uh, our e environmental state in the world and uh, questions about life and time on a macro scale. Let's go to the next image. Um, this is a, a seed vault in uh, the the Russian national seed vault that's in Kuban province that's about 2,000 miles from uh, St. Petersburg. But the, um, the questions that I found were, you know, we have this effort to preserve biodiversity, but we're, and we're extending life, we're kind of placing these, these little bits of life in suspended animation. And I wondered, I had all these questions that came out of this about what seeds are we saving and why are we saving these seeds and how do our culture, the particular cultural place, affect what seeds are saved. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, especially in face of uh, famine and kind of uh, other global threats posed by climate change or political instability. This is the barley collection in St. Petersburg, which was originally at the, uh, the most biodiverse, the biggest global seed bank, but it was actually a national bank. But uh, the man you can see, uh, whose photograph has been pasted on that uh, wall, he, uh, he had made over a hundred expeditions to collect plants from all over the world to preserve uh, species that might be useful to humans. And so, you know, you, as you think about that, our seed banks today are facing the same kind of questions about they're funded by governmental agencies and this question of choice about who might, you know, who, who does it benefit? Is it, why would you save wild seeds versus agricultural seeds? Um, all those questions are raised even today and because we're funded by governing bodies. And, you know, you can't preserve all seeds, so you have to make choices. And those kind of questions about uh, these philosophical and intangible questions about preserving life are embedded in the installation that's at MOCA Toronto now. And so I um, work together to, um, to make this installation to kind of 
and pose those questions and engage people in a really direct way that is different from the way that when you're looking at a photograph or the x-ray pictures that ask those questions uh, of the viewing public. So let's, let's go to the next picture. Um, these, these are actually orchid seeds in Australia. And the reason I put these in here is, you know, when we think of seeds, they're, they are seed banks themselves. You know, they can withstand, uh, there is a grain of wheat that uh, preserved itself in the desert for 2000 years that they found in a pyramid in Egypt that they were able to sprout. And when you think about them, you, they're simultaneously, they're like dust. They can be tiny. These are, these are the smallest seeds in the world. So they are indeed quite tiny, but they, they're simultaneously really delicate and really fragile, but also they maintain the power of life um, in these tiny, tiny specks that you might not even think about. So um, let's go to the next one. So we start, I started with the, this is a coffee seed. And um, as I was photographing in the seed banks and doing the documentary part of the, of the project, I became really interested in these kind of more existential or philosophical questions. And the conversations with the scientists led me to collaborate with them to use their on-site uh, research equipment to make images of the seeds in the seed banks. Now, one question I get a lot is, uh, does the x-raying of the seeds damage them? And yes, it does. So once they're x-rayed, you can't plant this seed and have it germinate. But they do, what they do is as they're collecting the seeds, they make a collection for research and they would share the research seeds with me. And that's what these images are from uh, research collections around the world. So in um, Archiving Eden, the, uh, in the exchange project, what you'll see is a variety of agricultural seeds, like this banana seed, and then um, wild seeds, which these are the next two are this one, and the other one are very, very rare um, plants that only live in tiny spots in Western Australia. And so those, uh, those x-rays, allow when people engage with the project, which Saye and Ivana are gonna talk about, they, um, I, I printed over 5,000 prints and then we hand punched little tiny punch, it, punch holes in them and hung them on the inside of this installation. And visitors are asked to choose which image they would like to have. And um, you can choose any one, but Part of the, and you can take it home as a gift, but what you do is part of it is that you're replacing it with an actual living seed in a tiny glassine envelope that's the same size as the print. And in conversation with Ivana and Saye and others, you're asked to consider those questions about uh, native seeds or agricultural seeds. What might you build a seed bank with? Because um, the seed bank that we have on site at MOCA, even though it's a living seed bank, it goes from being a photographic seed bank to an actual living collection of seeds that will be donated to the Botanical uh, Garden in Toronto in their seed exchange. Uh, they have a seed library, a seed lending library. Um, but you, you have to choose, are we gonna make a seed bank that is only wild and native species or perhaps agricultural species. And um, each, each person who came in had a conversation. So there's 5,000 different conversations represented by these slowly changing uh, images. And we didn't get to the point where it became a complete seed bank because of COVID-19. And of course, if you can imagine in this era, uh, having a, a an installation that requires close contact and conversation and it, touching seeds and touching an artwork. It's the, exactly like the worst possible storm of uh, circumstances, but it's still at the same time that, you know, it's not able to kind of come to completion at MOCA because of that. It also brings to mind this uh, 
extreme environmental moment that we're in and the risk for the future for us. So, and I'm happy to answer any questions whenever. Thanks so much for that, Jornath. Um, I just want to ask, um, I know people are probably interested in um, the, the, these seed vaults. I didn't really personally know a lot about um, these seed vaults and where they're located and sort of how many, the scope of the different varieties of seeds that are stored there. And I found that really fascinating on a personal note. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, um, are there any, or you, you know, you probably have um, some knowledge about um, any species that were preserved that are now extinct in, in nature? Um, what percentage of seed vaults has that kind of seed versus seeds that are that are also um, alive and well in the wild? Well, it's interesting. They all, uh, that is one of the questions that really posed, uh, that came up a lot as I was going to do the different seed banks. Um, bananas are really particularly interesting uh, story in, in relation to what you're talking about. So there's 1,700 seed banks around the world. And that's not counting um, smaller individual uh, home seed banks where people or farms or collect collective uh, activities by farmers that also that's considered a seed bank as well. But there's 17 worldwide, 1700 worldwide wide approximately. And some will like in England, the Millennium Seed Bank is trying to preserve all of their species. So they have banked uh, approximately 95% of 95% uh, of the their um, seeds that are possible to seed bank. You know, it's a really highly technical um, challenge to place seeds in a state of suspended animation. So some that are water-based plants, for instance, it's not possible yet to really do that. And um, some plants are uh, have trouble maintaining the characteristics of the parents, the seeds do. So uh, crops like oranges or bananas or almonds are nut, are nut crops, are uh, stone fruit crops, uh, potatoes are all cloned, which is mean that they're they're grown from grafting. And there is right now in uh, bananas, which if you'll click ahead, it's a really particularly beautiful seed, but they are super, bana bananas for the most part don't really have very many seeds and they're really hard to collect. So there's been this tendency to grow them from cuttings and they'll have a field that's 100% genetically identical. So like potatoes in the Irish potato famine, there is a blight very similar to that that is wiping out um, bananas worldwide. And they are expecting the type of banana, our table banana to go extinct very quickly. So there's a race right now in seed banking to, to develop a blight resistant banana. And they're doing that through seeds because um, you know the cuttings of course don't mix up aren't biodiverse enough to really preserve them for a threat like that did i answer your question alexander yes you did yes okay. you. um and another question i had about um you know when we see these images of the seed banks which are pretty vast they obviously have thousands um, of species are they organized in a particular way i guess it probably depends on the facility um, i'm just curious to know how they're sort of labeled and organized within this huge structure Oh, well that was, yes, it's very interesting. They, um, and it has uh, changed over time. And so when you see an antique seed bank, it's, you know, very, all the notes might be handwritten, but the ink and the paper have to be able to withstand longer times. So there is a period where they would, you know, stamp them in tin, I've encountered that. And now um, they, when I was in Svalbard, they had switched to a, a digital tracking with a barcode system, like most libraries do. But that inventory and keeping track of, they keep track of all sorts of information about where the, the seed was collected and the like geo, you know, they geotag them so they know where they're collected. Because when you're trying to think about biodiversity, you don't want to collect one species all from one hillside 
in a, in a location that might have a microclimate that makes them particularly adapted to that spot. So they're trying to collect cousins so that they can have it, you know, there's not too much interbreeding, just like, you know, small communities of other kinds of populations that you wouldn't want to necessarily crossbreed them too tightly. That's fascinating. Um, and I also would like, I'll just skip ahead to this slide here. So I know um, the, the seed vault structure that was uh, produced for the physical installation contains spaces for 5,000 um, images or conversely seed packets. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about why that number is significant? Oh, yes. The reason that um, there's 5,000 is that that is the number that is required to adequately save a species. You can have smaller groups like, you know, a thousand seeds or 50 seeds. But to really, if you're talking about restarting a species, you need a deep enough biodiversity for it to really uh, be able to preserve it. And most of the time, the, the preservation that they're talking about is not a, like a doomsday scenario for the end of the world. It's more for uh, uh, like uh, strife or political instability where there is a civil war that interrupts the crops and that the, you know, or climate change events where they're trying to develop dryland species because a lot of agricultural areas will, are predicted to become deserts. So they're trying to get a robust population that could adapt to any kinds of different uh, possible future scenarios. That's really interesting. Um, now, well, can I, well, actually, I, sh I can tell you a couple examples. There's a couple of great stories where in the tsunami that was in the Philippines, um, you know, it, they're the world, the global collection for rice, the rice seed bank was destroyed in that. But because they had backup collections in different, uh, in different, there was a backup, you know, there was five, you know, 5,000 of all the different kinds of rice in the Philippines, but then there were backup collections and other parts and they were able to preserve the biodiversity there. Because you know, once those are wiped out, they're just gone. And yeah. um, so it's, you know, it's interesting. That is really interesting. And it's interesting how they could sort of just use other crops and kind of place them in, um, transplant them, I guess, um, in place of those lost. That's, that's quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about the actual photographs themselves. Um, as you mentioned before, you know, they were pretty meticulously printed, cut, um, you know, with the hole in it in, um, to make room for the nails on the wall. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process for producing those um, and sort of how this was, I know there's like a smaller variety of, of images that you used for those photos. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, how, what your process was for choosing those images? Well, I wanted um, since my part of what I'm thinking about is that it's not actually a seed vault. It's a metaphoric seed vault that presents uh, kind of uh, reflects my experiences at the different seed vaults around the world. So I really wanted um, a, some seeds that would be very common that people might actually even recognize like sunflower seeds. But then I also wanted um, uh, questions about these rare ones that might be very beautiful and unusual and look like a seashell or, you know, a sand dollar that might attract someone's uh, attention. And that would make you question, you know, what are the, what are, what things make you choose what, you know, make those choices. So it could be aesthetic. It could be knowing that you're familiar with the crop or maybe you eat the crop. And then, and then the whole wild ones, you may not never have heard of these plants before. And that those questions that, uh, you know, other people that are decision makers are trying to decide what, what might be valuable now and what might be valuable for the future. So the, the process of, of making this was so time consuming and so uh, challenging uh, to, we printed them and then hand, the, hand trim them and hand punch them with a little uh, crew of uh, friends and volunteers in Texas and then shipped them and, you know, came in and did the installation and hung them by hands with a group. And then um, for this iteration, 
uh, they are uh, laser cut, but then uh, and but then all punched by hands. So it's getting easier each time. <laughs> And then in terms of the actual hanging of the seats, so I always um, had the privilege of helping um, Saya and Ivana do this um, mm -hmm. at the MOCA installation. Um, and I noticed, especially in this picture too, uh, from the Science Center, there was a couple of lines of just photographs of coffee seeds. Yeah. Um, that was almost like a little Easter egg thing that you put in there. Um, was there any sort of significance behind that or just sort of something fun? Uh, well, it was, it was something fun. I thought, you know, when, since, we had the um, coffee seeds, and, and in both cases, the installation is next to a coffee house. So I'm assuming that the people who are coming are drinking coffee and that they might be interested in that. And so it was just like a little Easter egg. It was like, let's make a band and see if perhaps the people will want, you know, people will want the coffee more than others. But it turned in, you know, in each case, it's, you know, what, which ones people choose, you get this digital pattern that almost looks, you know, and then as it goes through, it gets more progressively whiter, but there wasn't ever a pattern that became like a band. Right. And then you talked a little bit about this earlier, but um, in terms of the, the seeds inside the seed packets, um, some of them were different varieties than what seeds are in the images um, hanging on the walls. So was there a reason why those are a little bit different and um, sort of can you talk about where the seeds came from and then um, where they're going afterwards? Oh, yes. So um, the seed packets are, you couldn't, in some cases there are sunflower seeds that we have that we are putting back in there. But, um, this, but the seeds that you replace the images with are not necessarily the same. You get to choose on both ends of things. And um, obviously the super rare seeds in from Australia, I wouldn't want to have um, placed in his seed bank in Toronto because they wouldn't be adapted. And we would, it would just, you know, those seeds would be wasted and they're too precious for that. So in this case, the idea is that to have seeds that could go into the botanical garden seed bank that would that then is is a community seed bank so you can go and get seeds from the, the botanical garden and plant them so there's a mixture of native canadian seeds that i'm very thankful to Saye because she is uh the president of all things native plant society in toronto super involved and so she was able to um access those in a great way and then uh, I had help with Anna Klasna with the local agricultural plants from Ontario Science Center. So uh, those are soy and uh, common plants that you might encounter that are also kind of a question about GMOs, right? There's, uh, would you put soy, which is so highly manipulated now in a seed bank? Uh, those kind of questions. But there's maple, there are, you know, native maple, there is globe thistle, and but also sunflower, soy, corn are is also here. That's great. So this this seems like a good uh, place to sort of transition to speaking with um, Saya and Ivana. I will just note if you do have questions, um, continue to put them into the Q and A box. If you have any questions for Dornith about anything um, else pertaining to this project or other projects she's worked on. Um, but yeah, let's maybe I'll move these slides a little bit forward. Um, to talk a little bit with um, Saya and Ivana, just in the installation, how it worked at MOCA, of course it was activated in specific ways um, during the run of, its, um, of the installation. So why don't we start with Ivana, because um, we have this image here. This is sort of a seed exchange in, in action. So um, as Dornith mentioned, we had specific days where um, visitors could come and sort of exchange, they could select a seed, exchange it for um, one of the photographs and take home the photograph as a memento um, of, of this exchange experience. Um, so Ivana, I'd love to ask you, how um, was your experience working with um, visitors and facilitating these exchanges? Did you find any um, interesting curiosities that visitors had or qu common questions maybe that they were interested in? I think that I was very lucky to be at, at this end of installation and to be able to witness to that uh, last layer, you know, like uh, of moving uh, our audience or our visitors from uh, inactive and passive to proactive situation. 
And I think that's always a privilege. It was, um, you know, we had whole ra range of people coming and visiting with very, very different motivations. We had everything from the first date and birthdays to, you know, like uh, seasoned Mocha and other galleries visitors. So um, in that way, uh, like it was always fresh, always new, always different. But what was common for most of them was that people just like me before I started uh, helping Dornit had no idea. We never, we never, you know, even stopped to, to give a thought to the idea of, uh, I would say, biopreservation, you know, like, and, and stuff like that. So, um, all of them would be almost, you know, in a way surprised with me uh, interrupting their contemplation of, of the vault. And the vault itself, I, I just, uh, I'm really sorry we couldn't stay, you know, like until the end, because vault itself, like inside, is very, very peaceful and uh, con contemplative space and it's just like you also notice that people tended to stay inside you know they just they they would uh they would uh, see the the installation from the inside they would do the exchange and then they would stay so i called it a coffee coffee vault you know <laughs> because they loved it so it was very interesting because i could see how they um uh, make decisions what moves them how they're surprised you know and then and you would see someone would pick food, someone would pick something else. It's very, very interesting, you know. And of course, uh, depending on motivation of a particular person, very different questions. Are these seeds uh, native? And then that uh, very, very common uh, discussion about yucca seed, is it native or not, you know? And then Saif would have to all, every time uh, kind of, you know, solve that <laughs> mystery for us many, many things, many things. Were there any um, particular seed photos that were more uh, favorites of for visitors course. that you found? Of course, uh, uh, those um, Australian ones, my best sellers. So I had to spread them really <laughs> everywhere, you know, so because you know, they're so uh, decorative. And then uh, Dornit was talking about, you know, how people make decisions. It was very, very interesting, you know. You, they kind of reveal themselves through making this decision. You know, we are not here to judge and we are not doing that, but we, you can see, you know, how they reveal themselves. So some people go with appearances, which is fine. Some go with, um, uh, with utility of particular seed. I want to have food, you know, like, or I, 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 I'm very worried about butterflies. So I'm going to preserve, you know, like um, a milkweed and stuff like that. So, but I could say that really my best sellers were Australian seeds and you were kind enough to make a cheat sheet of all the seeds and with uh, actual photos of actual plants like in real life and we have them on the table next to Sai and I have to tell you everyone everyone who came and did the exchange actually not everyone but like significant majority of people made the photos so they will have with themselves not only a on its gift, but also like the whole shit with the name of, of their, you know, like uh, plant and they, they promise they are going to Google and research more. That's great. Um, so maybe we'll turn it over to say now. Mm -hmm. um, so you were leading workshops just to the side of the a seed ball and I have a couple pictures here. Um, so I'd love for you to talk a little bit about this workshop, The Power of a Single Seed, that you um, facilitated several times. We had a few different days where um, we ran the workshop um, and sort of what got you interested in the project. I know you have like a long um, history and career with environmental sustainability and personal interest, of course, with, um, with seeds and plants. Um, so yeah, I wondered if you could give us a few thoughts on uh, sort of how you got involved and how people responded to this workshop. Well, um, I came on board when uh, Ivana recruited me at a seed exchange and uh, could see that I was passionate about it. And um, I came on board the project and uh, it was very interesting to see how people reacted to seeds. Not a lot of people are used to growing with seeds, so it was a little bit of a learning curve. But I specifically developed the, this workshop, The Power of a Single Seed, to allow a deeper conversation uh, and about all the questions that were being raised by um, 
Gernth's beautiful, uh, thoughtful exhibit. And it was a, it had a focus on native plants. Um, so visitors would get a chance to reflect on those kinds of conversations going on, but uh, also the ecological implications of choosing plants to grow and preserving. And in the spirit of the gift exchange that was um, in Dornith's exhibit, um, visitors would get a chance to uh, choose a particular sprouted seed and uh, take it home with a little pack of soil and a little pot and uh, raise it to plant in their own garden. So it was a continuation of that spirit of gifting and sharing. And the goal was to make a relationship between the visitors, the seats, and uh, make it a personal connection and give them something tangible in addition to the beautiful picture uh, to remember their experience. So it, it was awesome. I loved it. Were there any um, particular questions or common um, curiosities that you found that, that visitors had for you or were they more just sort of eager to learn um, during the workshops? Uh, visitors were excited, all ages, interested to learn, but uh, um, particularly the children, I was impressed with how much they were environmentally aware already. Our education system is doing something really well. And so um, I used a popular education method where it would engage people to share their own, bring their own experiences to the table. And maybe the children had less hesitation and were more eager, but uh, when the topics changed to natives, they knew all about the monarchs and the milkweed and the life cycle. And uh, often it was a very revealing moment for the children to see, uh, for the parents to see how much the children actually were already engaged. It's a very hopeful future. That's great. Um, we do have a couple of questions coming in, so I'll just um, quickly ask these now. Um, so we had a question from Taro, or Taro. Um, okay, I'll just read it here. So as an Australian, I appreciated the introduction by Alexandra. It got me thinking, how responsive are the plant sciences communities to critiques of the more troubling aspects of their work in history? Say, questioning scientific naming of species after less than ideal persons, for example, Cook and Banks. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Doran, do you have any insights or thoughts on that? Well, you know, that's a, of course that I encountered that because of being in Australia. And so uh, there, the Banksia is, is a really famous species there, which is named after Joseph Banks. And, but, you know, oddly enough, the, I think it's, uh, since they're not discovering new species, they're preserving existing species. Their focus is more on the technology and science uh, around seed banking rather than the naming protocols. And I think that the, for them, it's one of those uh, invisible moments where they, uh, there was, there was uh, the one conversation I had about naming was there was a plant called Flinders, which uh, was named after somebody who had rowed around the whole continent of Australia in order to map it. And so I think that it's a really important question. And of course, it does reflect those cultural insensitivities and imperialism that historically is tied to, to seed banking or any kind of natural resource preservation or exploitation. But the, specifically, that did not come up. What did come up with is uh, the notion of the exchange of plants over time that I would come up, I would encounter, for instance, Australian plants uh, everywhere. And uh, because of the ship's masts, you know, that eucalyptus were uh, exported back in the age of British uh, British colonial, colonial in, influence over Australia, they took the, you know, the, the eucalyptus and planted them everywhere so they, that, ship, that they could, so that ship masts when they needed to replace them would be available to them. So I, I saw that more of a Colombian exchange rather than specifically being, you know, our a moment now where we're trying to be 
much more aware and careful about those issues, which is appropriate, of course. Right. Um, and then another question about seed banks. This one's from Vanessa. Um, she asks, do most seed banks try and collect all seeds from around the world or just locally or by continent? And if it specializes in a single type of seed, for example, barley in St. Petersburg, would it collect barley seeds from around the world? Um, well, there's a, there, uh, that's, a, that's an interesting and important question. And seed banks have different, different types of seed banks and different missions. So there are key crops. There's, a, there's an organization that's related to the National Seed Bank, uh, International Seed Bank Consortium, which is called, it's C-I-G-A-R, which is an internet, I've forgotten all what the acronym means, but it's uh, where they have important agricultural crops that are agricultural research stations on globally important crops. So that would be rice, corn, uh, wheat, uh, I think barley, but I'm not sure. But crops like that that are mainly, and potatoes are a part of it. So uh, those are collecting as broad a uh, 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 collection that they can, but most of them are located in the centers of origin for the species. So what they find is that the biodiversity of a species is um, highest at its uh, location of origin. So where, you know, wheat is from the Fertile Crescent, so all the different kinds of wheat that you can find are really uh, very, you know, found mostly there. And then they get transported and changed over generations to other places, but the native wild uh, cousins are most, uh, most broadly, you know, available in the centers of origin. Did I answer all that? That was a multi-part question. I think so. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then we do have another question. This one's from Judy. Are the seed banks able to keep up with our current rate of extinction? No. <laughs> I'm, that's, it's terrible. No. You know, that, and part of that is resources. That we, they're limited in scope and they're limited in budget. They are, um, you know, you don't, and you know, sometimes uh, some wild seeds that are very rare you don't they're so adapted to not only the soil and the climate but also the microorganisms in the soil that it's very hard to um, you wouldn't want to deplete them in the wild except if they were going the uh, they were going to lose that habitat so in western australia for instance the mining companies are required to do a survey and they have found species that only grow in a couple of meters across area you know like two meters maybe and those have are uh, collected and preserved but that but you you wouldn't necessarily um, you know that's not a super common practice in the United States I know because they wouldn't want to disrupt the the ecosystem that they come from. And most in, in the US, it's, you know, and in fact, a lot of banks, it's economically important plants, which means plants that are directly tied to humans, rather than trying to collect and bank all uh, biodiversity around the world. Right. So, okay. Yeah, since we're in this era of, you know, burning down the the rainforest or removing that, there are species that are being lost at an extraordinary rate and there aren't the resources to uh, properly collect them. And, and I do wanna mention to people that they should not necessarily go out and try to help by collecting rare plants in the wild and then seeding, sending those seeds in because uh, the, it has to be done really, really carefully and all the data has to be uh, collected. So I would, uh, you know, it's not as helpful to, to do that. I just want to warn that because sometimes people feel like they want to help and they want to directly engage by doing that. And that's not necessarily a, a helpful thing. Right. Um, one more question. This one's from Sabrina. Um, considering the vault is populated with both agricultural and wild or native seeds, are you thinking about monoculture versus permaculture and which of these methods are more sustainable or beneficial for the environment? Well, uh, thank you, Sabrina. That's a great question. Um, monoculture, you know, is, it pre presents a lot of risks. And one of the reasons that 
uh, it has developed over time is that you can, uh, the breeding that we have underway since the 60s and the Green Revolution was a way of producing lots and lots of food for an ever-growing human population. And so the factory model uh, came into being as a way of addressing that ever-growing need for food. But of course, the lack of biodiversity it also presents these huge challenges where the that depletes the soil and you know there's uh, lots of movements for using perennial um, perennial agricultural crops so that the soil and the health of the bio the biome can be preserved but that's uh, just you know coming into its own thank you um, another question <clears throat> from Alexandra, um, are new seed banks being established? If so, are they largely concentrated in the Northern Hemisphere and what does this mean for the conservation of tropical species? Um, no, they're not necessarily just in the Northern hem Hemisphere. They are, tropical uh, seed banks are being established in countries based on their resources. You know, there's still a challenge um, because of the, uh, you know, uh, if you're in a very inst unstable uh, country that might be dealing with something like COVID, the health requirements and the resources that fighting something like that, uh, you know, requires makes it hard to focus on a seed bank. And there are partnerships between some of the major seed banks in other parts of the area where the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is, is funding transportation to Svalbard, and that there are research teams, you know, the scientific community is kind of uh, outside the governmental restrictions, and so they have reached out to help those other, there's resources for them in terms of scientific knowledge, but maybe not money, and trying to figure that pieces out. So um, they are growing, but uh, you know, it's always a challenge. Right, um, and get, just on the note of COVID-19, um, I wanted to actually pose this question to all three um, of you, Dornith, Ivana, and Saye. Um, how, have, how has the global pandemic situation made you consider this project um, maybe in a different way or give it a new meaning. I'm thinking more specifically with the, the seed exchanges and how it, the activation of the piece is really reliant on these physical interactions and conversations with visitors. Um, has it sort of made you rethink or, or given it sort of new meaning for you at all? I'm gonna let them, I've been speaking. So do y'all, Ivana, Saye, do you okay, have- Okay, so, so for me, it, it just, this situation just proved that there are some things that are best done in person that has have to be done you know like with people it's just like you know because i think this installation without us at the at, you know um kind of adding that uh, function of uh, interaction and uh, either learning or making people think and make decisions and you know surprise them and put them on the spot i think it would be something else <laughs> so i think if you look at uh, at our exhibition, I think uh, this just proved. I, you know, things are better done in person. That's my opinion. Yeah, Ty, what do you think? In 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 my view, I've seen a flourishing of gardening activity, and I've seen so many people getting interested in growing things um, as a question of food security, as a empowerment, as social change. And uh, I have a little online seed business and uh, I, it, it's been mind boggling. The people that, you know, they don't have experience, but they're passionate and they're going after it. So I think um, it has caused an, an awareness of the issues that arise, but uh, let's see, hopefully it's a longer term issue and not just a passing that everybody gets sucked into the old ways back again. Right. Well, and for me, what's, what has been striking in my mind is also the notion of this doomsday scenario that a uh, future that is, that is so dark that you think it would never happen, which is the COVID-19 has made me think about biodiversity and the fact that how urgent 
that is, and there's been a lot of calls about preserving biodiversity, and yet people somehow either feel like it's a, a future that wouldn't happen, or that individual action doesn't matter, or can't that it's too big a global problem for individual action to matter. And if you think about the metaphor of, of dispersal and wearing masks and individual responsibility and how that really makes a difference in, the, in controlling the contagion, that, that you could see this as a positive thing about the awareness that it, you know, small actions in preserving biodiversity really do make a huge difference uh, when considered at the global scale. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's, it's a, a scary time and very uh, dark present, but also this collaborative coming together where people are thinking about their personal actions in terms of global responsibility. I think it's really interesting to think about that in terms of preserving biodiversity. Yes, definitely, I agree. Um, just looking at our time, just with the last couple of minutes, um, we do have one last question from Anna. Um, that I believe this is for Dorneth. Was this exhibition different from your other photography um, installations and what is the next project you're working on? Yeah, well, thank you for uh, asking that question. That's, it is very different. Um, the, the difference is uh, with the, the, it's the first time I really had a social engagement project where people are asked to um, interact so differently. And so I have really loved this project and loved working on this installation. And the, um, the way that uh, it worked at the Science Center is very different than the way it worked at MOCA, but having, uh, meeting the, the power of volunteers who I didn't know before I came and, uh, you know, used to working with curators and you, through working with them, you become friends and, and connect. But the connection that I feel with Ivana and Saye and their experience and in for, informing my understanding of how this works since it's remote, I'm in Texas. And this has been at the up for almost a year now in two places in Toronto, that their understanding of the way that the impact it's had and the way people think about it, if you, you know, it's really been a wonderful experience. So I continue to work on Archiving Eden. There's, a, I have a sh the shows up right now that are, you know, in this kind of weird limbo. And um, so I have a show up right now at the Smithsonian Museum, Natural History Museum in Washington, DC, that will be up for a year. And so hopefully at some point it'll open and people will be able to see it. But um, so that's ongoing. And then I'm working with, uh, particulate air pollution and birds, migratory birds right now, uh, among other projects that are ongoing. Very cool. Thank you. I'd love to get down to the Smithsonian and check that out. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think um, that's just about our time. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone um, who tuned in for this uh, discussion. Um, thank you so much to Dornit, Say, and Ivana for uh, your time today. Um, I just put up Dornet's website here. If you're interested in learning more about her work, you can check out her uh, website as well as some of our social media handles if you're interested in um, learning more uh, through Instagram. Um, if you want to learn more about MOCA's other learning programs, you can check out mocha.ca. Um, we have um, sort of a rotating uh, film series on our Shift Key platform. You can find that on the website um, as well as some other learning activities um, on our blog as well, also on mocha.ca. Um, big thank you to the TD Bank Group and the Ready Commitment for sponsoring our TD Sunday program, as well as Scotiabank for sponsoring our public programs. Um, again, big thank you to our three panelists, also to my colleague Masaki for helping with the tech behind the scenes. Um, once again, thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Thank, thank you so much. You. Bye, thanks for coming in.